Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with our news, so you stay with us. We begin in Brazil where the Supreme Federal Court has voted in favor of a case that could, in theory, see the release of former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. The judges voted 6 to 5 in favor of a principle that defendants should not be in prison until all appeal processes have been completed. Nearly 5,000 people currently in prison could benefit from this new vote, including former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, as we were saying. Well, the Supreme Court's ruling is binding as mandatory. Each defendant legal team must file an appeal with the court so that their sentences can be reconsidered. This information was finally left to the uh, laid on the shoulders of the minister Diaz Toffoli, who had the final word on the vote. And now in order to have the real latest reactions after this vote took place, we go to Brazil with our correspondent Brian Mir. Brian, we hear you. Welcome. In Brasilia, the Brazilian Supreme Court's just made a historic ruling upholding the 1988 Constitution, which states that all citizens are innocent until proven guilty. And what this means is that defendants cannot be thrown in jail until they've exercised all of their rights to appeal. Last year, the Supreme Court made an exception to this rule to enable them to imprison Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, the former president who was leading in all of the election polls. And at the time, the military was threatening the courts. General Vilas Boas made a threat that was read over Jornal Nacional, global television's most popular news program, against the Supreme Court. But now they've mustered up the courage to uphold the Constitution. This has direct ramifications on Lula's case. The next steps now are that the court is going to publish its decision, then Lula's defense lawyers will file for his immediate release, and the judge has to sign off on it. If a judge tries to block it in any way, it's important to note that there's no longer any legal justification for that to happen. So even though Lula's imprisonment was very legally dubious from the get-go, there's no reason whatsoever there's no legal justification whatsoever for him to remain in prison now after this historic court ruling. And the real hero, I think, in this is Supreme Court Justice Rosa Weber. Now, she was visibly nervous last year when she decided to side with the majority against uh, giving Lula the right to wait his appeals process out in freedom. And uh, it happened the day after the, the general threatened the court justice ministers on TV, and it looked like she was scared. This time around in her decision, she cited Angela Davis, and she reversed her decision from last April, and that was the tie-breaking vote. And you can hear they're blowing off fireworks now in my neighborhood on the periphery of Sao Paulo, celebrating what appears to be Lula's imminent release. Thank you, Brian. We'll continue the development of this information on what happens with presi a former president, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. Now we move on to Bolivia, where violent opposition protests rocked the capital La Paz for a third day near the government palace and the presidential house. As part of an ongoing co-attempt, violent opposition groups responding to the call of uh, Ade Coca Organica and of opposition leader Luis Fernando Camacho, they mobilized to Murillo Square, where they have been stopped by fences. Security forces who are protecting the area maintain control of the situation, however, for people who were injured by these protesters who also damage infrastructure in the sector. And we move from topic for the 28th plenary occasion in which United Nations General Assembly has voted overwhelmingly rejecting and calling for an immediate end of the economic, financial and commercial blockade imposed to Cuba by United States. The resolution passed with 187 votes in favor, three against and two abstentions being United States and Israel once again who voted against the resolution and Brazil. 
that went on with them. The abstentions were from Colombia and Ukraine. The resolution that demands the end of the blockade and the measures that have tightened the U.S. arbitrary policy in recent months, like the activation of the Title III of the Helms-Burton Act, were uh, rejected by the international community. It expressed also the need to respect the sovereignty of the states and support it of and support the non-interventionist policies as laid down in the United Nations Charter. And when speaking to the United Nations General Assembly, Cuba's Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez made uh, the, his final words to this debate and detailed account of the impact of the almost six-decade blockade on the island. And he began by condemning the U.S. government by his recent tightening of these illegal measures, as we were saying, and putting an exact example, referring to the activation of Title III of the Helms-Burton Act. Let's hear exactly the words of the foreign minister. During the last few months, President Donald Trump's administration has started to escalate aggression against Cuba through the implementation of non-conventional measures to prevent the arrival of fuel shipments to our country from different markets by resorting to sanctions and threats against vessels, shipping companies and insurance companies. The intent, apart from damaging Cuba's economy, is to harm the living standards of Cuban families. The United States government is responsible uh, for announcing its decision in April this year to allow lawsuits to be filed before U.S. courts against Cuban and foreign entities under Title III of the Helms-Burton Act. Persecution of our banking and financial relations with the rest of the world has continued to intensify. Remittances sent to Cuban citizens have been restricted. The granting of visas has been reduced. Consular services have been limited. The agreement achieved between the best ball federations of both countries has been cancelled. Individual travel by American citizens has been stopped. Cruise ships travels as well as direct flights to Cuban airports, except for Havana's airport, were prohibited. Once again, the international community rejected this policy the United States puts on Cuba for almost 60 years. Now we move on to other topics. We go to Chile, where major trade unions are calling for a general strike ne next Tuesday, the 12th of November, as protests continue in the capital and other three cities. Leaders of the Dockers, Shop Workers and Miners Union, all members of the CAT Federation, criticized the human rights violation committed by forces of repression prompting up the government of Sebastián Piñera. They called for popular unity and repeated the demand for a constituent assembly to bring fundamental changes to Chile. It's going to be an historic day. The solidarity between workers is clear. We've been together mobilizing, and we have to come together as a society, beyond just as workers. We call on everyone to join us. Together we can work for the changes that the country needs. We are an organization that counts on more than 40,000 members and more than 100 unions. We are with the Code Federation. Unity is important to us above all. We call on the commercial sector and financial services not to work that day. We want to be clear that any talks, with whomever they may be, must stem from a basic respect for human rights. Human rights continue to be trampled on. Our kids are being shot while at school. This is something that needs to be addressed through a commission of justice and truth. We need to take control of the situation in the country. With respect to what we've spoken about and what we're in agreement on, a constituent assembly being called for by the people is a call coming from our communities, from our homes. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, referred to Chile 
this uh, Thursday, and he commended the fight of the Chilean people against neoliberal policies and prompted the government of Sebastián Piñera to stop this massive uh, repression. Let's hear exactly the words of the president. Our sister nation, Chile, rebellious Chile, Chile does not stop. It's very impressive. And thankfully, we have social networks where we can find out about what's happening because we only had CNN. Nobody will know anything. But thankfully, we have social networks and we have Telesur. So we can witness the rebellious need of the youth, of women, of workers, of all Chile, even of children. Chile has said enough and they will not stop until they achieve their goal. Chile's writing history will not forget 2019 has been the year of awakening for Chile. All of Latin America and the Caribbean will wake up. Long live Chile. And these words from President Nicolás Maduro were at the opening ceremony of the 15th International Book Fair of Venezuela, FILBEM 2015, that has been organized by the National Book Center and where more than 20 literary activities are planned to uh, happen on this fair. Among the workshops and seminars also, the invited country to this occasion is China. And there were get the part members of the Chinese delegation were welcome also. And the head of the group was Cao Hai Jun, who said that this is a new opportunity to continue interesting cultural exchanges with Venezuela. For his part, President Nicolás Maduro said that the fair, that this international book fair has books, uh, the books to build a deeply humanist vision for the future of Latin America, which will help create answers to capitalism. These were the words and what took place this Thursday in Caracas. With this invitation, if you are in Caracas, in Venezuela, to come and visit the International Book Fair, we go to a first break here from the South Maxure. You follow us on Twitter, follow us on English, and on my account at Laura Pitelesur. Stay with us. Back with our news, we go to the Caribbean in Barbados. The way seems clear for Mia Mali administration to draw down its third installment of 50 million US dollar under a third 300 million dollar international monetary fund loan. The money is intended to finance the island economic recovery and transformation program. Mali provided an update on the debt restructuring process after she met with a delegation in, of the International Monetary Fund in Bridgetown, the capital. 
two days ago we launched the external debt exchange and that is expected to close um, by the end of this month and I think that our ability to put behind us the debt restructuring exercise completely allows us to move fully into the next stage of the program which is literally to complete the structural changes that we have in our regulatory structure to make it easier not just to do business but for Barbadians to enjoy services that are delivered to them on a daily basis and then secondly for us to focus completely on the projects that are necessary to be able to really do the transformation um, be it the transformation of our people through the continuous training in the national training initiative over the next four years or the physical infrastructural projects that are absolutely critical and guyana's government remains in interim mode until march 2nd 2020 general elections are held this follows after last december's no confident motion was determined to have been validly passed president david granger assures that the government continues to adhere to the convention of the caretaker administration we have accepted that we are an interim administration. I, for one, apart from my health, I have not traveled to any international conferences you know, for over a year. And, um, and we have not entered into any major agreements. Since it came to office in 2015, Guyana's government has provided Christmas bonuses to public workers. But this year, there is no guarantee as the president is awaiting advice on whether the funds are available to make the much-anticipated tax-free payout. I'm not saying no, but um, after the next cabinet meeting, the Minister of Finance will be able to make uh, an announcement on that matter. And now we go beyond Latin America and the Caribbean frontiers. We go to France, where President Emmanuel Macron has described Nor Northern Atlantic Treaty Organization as brain dead as a result of the whining commitment from the United States. Macron told the Economist magazine that he believed there is a lack of a strategic coordination between European allies on the one hand and the United States and Turkey on the other. The French president warned European member countries that they can no longer rely on the United States to defend NATO allies. Meanwhile, the French president drew fire for his remark on the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel said the alliance remains vital for security in the region. The French president has chosen drastic words. That is not my point of view regarding the cooperation with NATO. I think such a sweeping swap is not necessary. Even though we do have problems, I have to sort ourselves out. And now we move on to other topics. Former Congolese rebel leader Basco Ntaganda will spend three decades behind bars for war crimes. And Tawanda, who served as military operations chief for the United Union of Congolese Patriots, our UPC rebel group has been sentenced to 30 years in prison by the International Criminal Court for crimes, including murder, rape and constricting child soldiers. The majority of the crimes were carried out between 20, 2002 and 2003 in the east of the country. The sentence is the longest that has been handed down by the court since its establishment in 2002. For a rape of civilians as a crime against humanity and as a war crime 28 years. For murder and attempted, attempted murder as a crime against humanity and as a war crime 30 years. For persecution as a crime against humanity 30 years of in. And like this, we go for a second and very short break. You stay tuned with us. Discover the cultural diversity that defines a continent.
place where art and tradition are part of the same nucleus. Artistic expressions, values, Fridays only on this world. Back with our news, United States and China reached an agreement to end the commercial war between the two countries. Our correspondent Iransi Perasaforte from Beijing has the detail for us. Welcome, Iransi. The Chinese government announced on Thursday that it has reacted an agreement with the United States to progressively pass out additional tariffs that both nations have been applying on each other as part of trade war over that past year. A spokesman for the Chinese Minister of Commerce that trade negotiators react an agreement and hope to react a final agreement to end this trade conflict. He also said that this elimination of tariff must be done simultaneously and in the same proportions. So far, there is no confirmation that the United States has annulled this agreement with China. However, this is already one of the most important parts reacting negotiation between the two nations. Previously, the two nations achieved a limited agreement during a 13th round of trade negotiations in October. According to U.S. President Donald Trump, that agreement represents a principle of understanding to react an eventual greater consensus. The agreement covered the base of intellectual property, financial service, and the exchange rate. Beijing and Washington also made commits to cancel an increase by $250 billion of tariff on Chinese products in October and to make agricultural pork case in the U.S. market for $50 billion. Thank you, Iramsi. And from China, we move on to Lebanon, where hundreds of demonstrators have rallied outside the electricity utility headquarters in Beirut, the capital, as they continue to shine a light on corruption at state-run institutions. The nighttime protests erupted mere hours after outgoing Prime Minister Saad Al Hariri met President Michael Aoun but failed to announce any progress towards signing and forming a new government. The anti government protests are in their fourth week aimed at rising anger over the high cost of living, new tax plans, and corruption. While waving Lebanese flags and banging past pots and pans, demonstrators voice their grievances. I am protesting today because the electricity institution is one of the most corrupt institutions in Lebanon. And to get rid of this corruption, we will be protesting in front of all public institutions so we can shine a light on the corruption in these places, demand reform, the change of laws, and let the political elite know that their cards have been revealed and they need to work harder on these reforms. The government resigned, but the street's pressure is still as important as it was before the resignation of the government. Because this state is ruled, as soon as we leave the streets, it is ready to divide and argue over shares like before. We have so far realized many things from the streets. 
And now to have more details about what takes on in Beirut, in Lebanon, we have the following report from our correspondent, Wafika Ibrahim. Welcome, Wafika. Tell us. Protests continue in Lebanon without pause. On Thursday, for the first time since former Prime Minister Fau Sinora was a cause of embasement, which happened over 10 months ago, he was summoned to court. Here, he answered questions about his knowledge over the disappearance of billions of Lebanese pounds from public coffers. Most of this money disappeared during Sinora's time as prime minister between 2006 and 2008. During the questioning, he was asked about where many donations and loads end up, as they were not properly loaded in his administration's financial statements. There were also revelations that the current foreign minister had agreed to resign. Another development is that the former prime minister, Saad Hariri, met with President Michael Aoun as part of the first meeting to resolve the crisis since his resignation. Hariri said he will meet with other politicals as well. In any case, students once again left class on Thursday to join the ongoing massive protest. One final thing to add is that there are reports that United States and Gulf countries are actively working to form a future Lebanese government in which people's resistance will have no political representation. But Hariri has allegedly been told by protest leaders that they will not accept such an arrangement, a position that was repeated by Foreign Minister Gibrat Basil during a meeting on Wednesday. In the end, the situation in Lebanon continues to become more and more complex as the economy continues to spiral and now there is the possibility of foreign interference. Thank you, Wafi. And now we move on to other topics. We go to Africa because to South Sudan because with less than a week to go before the deadline for the formation of a government of national unity, South Sudan President Salva Kiir and rebel leader Reik Mashar have met in Uganda to try to salvage the peace deal signed last year. The two rivals agreed last year to form governments of national unity by November 12th as part of efforts to end the six-year conflict that has killed more than 300,000 people. However, their failure to agree on critical issues such as the composition of the army threatens to sink the deal. And now we move on to South Africa, where the victorious national rugby team have kicked off their nationwide victory parade. The team's open bus brought business to a standstill in Johannesburg Central Business District. As thousands of excited fans line up the streets to catch a glimpse at the world champions. In the next five days, the team will visit the country's largest cities, including Cape Town, Durban and Port Elizabeth. And in other kind of topics, House Democrats in the United States will begin public hearings next week for the first time as they continue the impeachment inquiry into United States President Donald Trump. Three State Department officials will be the first to testify, and so far key witnesses have given sworn statements behind closed doors. The Democrats are seeking to remove Trump from office on claims that he pressured Ukraine to publicly announce an investigation into political rival Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden. Like this, we come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find this and much more other information on our website, tellsyourenglish.net, where you can find this and much more other news. So you continue with us with Telesur always together, connecting our global public. Next time, thank you for watching.